We talked to comedian Lou Perez of We the Internet on this edition of Kibbe on Liberty. We talk about speech Nazis on campus. We talk about how comedy could bring us all together. And we absolutely agree that Nathan Phillips is no John Bonham. This um, this this set is designed to, to sort of make people feel at home. Like I want I want someone to sort of accidentally start telling the truth, like they might in their own living room. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm kind of getting I, I've I never met either of my grandparents. Well, I, uh, my grandfather's. So I imagine this would be a room that Grandpa would take me to to tell me stories about his life. So I'm in a weird position because I feel like you're going to have to start opening up to me right now. About well, you're, you're calling me old, I think, is what I'm hearing. I look <laughs> just, just like, room. Just just the like the ro- your dead grandfather. Exposed brick. Yeah, yeah. It just has that feel to it. Um, but this, this show is really designed to, to make everybody a little bit uncomfortable. And it, and, and it seems appropriate to talk to a comedian about that because that's your job. In a sense, yeah. 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 So, so tell everybody who you are and, and, and we the internet and all that stuff. Cool. Uh, so I'm Lou Perez. I'm the head writer and executive producer for We the Internet TV. And we're a comedy uh, news channel. We take on politics uh, and culture and do, in most part, for the most part in you know, satirical ways. Yeah, yeah. And how long have you been doing We the Internet? I think we're going, I think we're going into our fourth year. Um, I think we launched our first sketch uh, that was actually called Trigger Warnings uh, back in, I think it was September of 2015. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to do a shameless plug? Like, should should people subscribe to this? YouTube oh, you page? guys should definitely subscribe to it uh, after. But after, by the way, keep me on liberty. Like, if you <laughs> if your thumb gets tired clicking on one thing, you just right. you do this show first. Yeah, it's two for it's two for one. It's very easy to subscribe. Yeah. Um, check us out on on YouTube and Facebook uh, as well, and we're on basically all the major all the major platforms. You know. So, so how did obviously you were into comedy before you started We the Internet? Um, you, would you go to Hollywood? You wanted to be a star, that kind of thing? Well, well actually, I, I didn't start uh, We the Internet. Um, I was fortunate enough to be out in L.A. at a time where um, some friends of mine were putting on kind of like an all-day uh, lecture series on film production and film distribution. And it was there that I met with— Is this uh, Talia's Nexus? What was it? No, it was— um, um, uh, Ted and Courtney Balaker, okay, actually, okay. Who, who you know yeah. from uh, Little Pink House. Yeah, and, awesome, awesome movie. Yeah, and Can We Take a Joke uh, yeah. as well, a great documentary. And uh, at this event, uh, they introduced me to Lana Link, who was the uh, a talent coordinator, and I met with her, and she said, yeah, we're, we're looking to do sketch comedy and politics. And I said, well, you know, I've been doing sketch comedy for like 13 years at that at that point, and and I'm like, you know, I've done some like political, uh, you know, political sketches, but not many. But hey, why don't we put the two together and see what happens? So, did you try to make a living as as a comedian before that? Um, is that I, is that possible? Uh, I think everybody's trying to, you know, obviously that's the goal, you know, to try to, you know, try to make a living. Um, it depends on what on what you want to do, you know, because. Uh, like say for example, if you want to just do uh, primarily stand-up comedy, it takes a long time to get those paying gigs. And you know, you even have you know fantastic comedians who you know you'll see on TV and stuff. But if they're at like a local club, you know they're getting like fifteen dollars a spot, uh, yeah. as opposed to you know uh, you know road comics who are who are out there uh, hustling. Um, and you know, bef- I've sort of been doing all of it when it comes to comedy sketch comedy improv uh stand-up comedy um so i feel like i feel like being a successful comedian probably means that you're poor too and 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 maybe a drug addict i don't know if those things have to go together but (laughs) but there seems to be a history of that um i'm I'm thinking of lenny bruce who who Right, who was, who did all sorts of things to to pay the rent while he was uh, uh, habitually getting arrested for for upsetting the the thought police. Yeah, and you wonder, you know, what you know, what sort of options did he have at the time? You know, he was he started out 
I guess you probably know more about this than I do, but like sort of, you know, hosting burlesque shows and, 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 you know, doing like kind of like vaudeville acts and that sort of thing. And then, uh, I know he, he definitely did TV, but when he started to get really uh, political and, and really obscene, you know, I I'm, I can't imagine there were that many, you know, phone calls coming in for him to... He was mostly you know. banned, and it, it, it probably says something about his immense talent that, that some people would still have him on TV because it was, you know, you're risking everything putting him on TV. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, before we get into that, and I, I, I definitely want to get into that, but I, I've selected beers for this conversation. This is a drinking show ah. more than anything. Um, sort of uh, uh, drunk libertarian politics where we don't even want to talk about politics. We're going to skirt politics part altogether. <laughs> but I've selected a lighter beer for your, your gentle palate, um, but from a, a fantastic brewery, Hill Farmstead, uh, they make a, a, a beautiful lager called Marie. Marie, um, unfiltered German style. What, what does German style mean when it comes to... Uh, it means beer? it means it's probably has uh, German hops and German malts like you would have in a classic German Pilsner. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, say what you will about the Germans, they... They they made some good beers back in the day. They made some mistakes. Yeah, but well, you know, there, there some, were there did, were some, did some really bad. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And I, I I chose a more manly beer for myself, a heady topper. I mean, so, look at I'm, the size of that thing yeah, too. It's I'm, massive. Yeah, I'm not yeah. judging. I feel like I got a little a little boy beer here. But I was that's um, great. You know, I, I bring that's up I bring up Lenny Bruce because I I was I did a I, I did a deep dive on on this whole debate about comedy. And political correctness, and 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 you've been taking that on um, from day one at, at We the Internet. But I watched this. I don't know if you saw this piece. Uh, Michael Moynihan at, at Vice News mm-hmm. did a piece about about comedy on campus, and I hadn't seen it before. It, it, it's shocking to me how alike the the authorities that that book comedians on campus now. They have. They have all these criterion of, of things you can't say and people you can't offend and you can't go here and you can't go there. And it sounded exactly to me like the thought police, the cops that used to sit in Lenny Bruce's audience back in the day. And they would arrest him afterwards if he said something that, that was, was not allowed. But, but these kids that were curating these comedians today we're saying, you know what? We'll actually cut off this guy's mic. We will pull him off stage if he triggers anybody. And and who? What would Lenny Bruce say about those guys? He would call them fascists, mm-hmm. which I think is funny. And, and then use the word "dig" here yeah. and there. Dig yeah. it, man. These dig fascists, it. man. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting. Uh, I, I saw that that same piece, and it's it's sort of like, uh, you know, sort of a top down. Uh, you know, authoritarian idea of of these are the ideas that we are going to allow you to to hear because we are going to make these judgments uh, these judgments for you. And I think Moynihan, oh, I think he might have uh, asked the question like, well, how do you even know that the students don't want to hear yeah. you know he- hear this sort of thing? And I don't know what kind of uh, I don't know how you make that that assessment, especially you know when it comes to to ideas and and the arts. You know, you're talking about kids who are ages, what, 17 to 22, where, you know, I look back at, at where I was at, at that time and, and, you know, believe it or not, I, there was a lot about the world that I didn't know. And thankfully, I was exposed to ideas that, you know, shook me up a little bit and, and, and frightened me. I remember um, uh, in college was the first time that I had a gay friend, an openly gay friend. Um, that was, you know, hugely important to me. Um so the the idea, the, the idea of having you know a, an adult or you know uh, anyone saying okay well well we're not going to let you see this we're gonna you should go and see this um, I don't know the, the sort of anti authoritarian streak in me just wants to push back against that. Well, it's I mean it's bizarre. I mean this is these are called liberal arts colleges, and I I wonder. I wonder what it, that what the word liberal even means because you know I'm I'm so old school that that I used to be a liberal I was mm-hmm. a, I was a classical liberal but I think you identify as libertarian mm-hmm. um, we won't we won't judge small I think small L small L, L. Yeah. yeah although although one thing that I definitely want to do I want to regain the word libtard for libertarians yeah I want libertarians to be like yeah man we're we're libtards 
We want to. I want to embrace that. I don't know how many more people I can get on that movement. I, I feel but, like we're trying sometimes. We're, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. We're, we're capable of getting there. <laughs> but I, I'm like a double L libertarian. So I'm I'm like the libertarian that is so extremely libertarian that there's really only one person that gets to define what that is, and that's me. Uh-huh. And everybody else is is impure and. I'm, I'm imagining just all the Spanish-speaking yeah. libertarians calling you like, libertarian or something like that with, with a double L. My goal is to chase you out of the room before we're done talking, just, <laughs> just because you're you're clearly not pure enough. And I don't even remember what the question was anymore. But so the word liberal, <clears throat> liberal arts, um, if it if it meant anything, it meant um, challenging people to think for themselves. Yeah, and and. Uh, I'm new to this whole safe space uh, trigger warning culture. I've, I've, I've spent the last couple of months sort of catching up with everybody else. But I don't even know how we got here. Like, it's, it's insane. But, you know, the idea of even having comedy on campus in a world where there are safe spaces, it's like a contradiction in terms. Because comedy is supposed to make you uncomfortable. It's supposed to make you think. It's supposed to make you sweat a little bit and say, did he just say that? And it's also an opportunity to talk about things that you're normally not allowed to talk about. Now, I'm in a, I'm, I'm in a very weird spot because my, my job is making comedy. Mm-hmm. So the conversations that I'm allowed to have with collaborators, with, uh, you know, with the people I work with, are really different than you know, somebody who you know, works in an office or um, you know, is, has to you know, wear like a stuffy suit. Um, so there's something about, about comedy that's sort of like, you know, people are coming to it to get away from um, the stuffiness of their everyday life. And I think people forget that, you know, comedy is supposed to be fun. And, you know, recently one of the, one of the, the joys that I had was, what, was I put on Netflix and I got to watch um, this comedian, Sebastian Maniscalco, his new uh, his new Netflix special, his stand up special, and I'm there sitting with my wife watching this, and I'm howling, laughing, tears are coming out of my eyes. Um, this guy is telling original, uh, you know, doing original comedy, telling original stories. Um, there are things in his life that I can connect to, other things that I can't connect to, and there's something really beautiful happening there. Where, where you know, to quote a, a Billy Joel song, I get to forget about life for a while. Yeah, and. And I, and I feel like uh, we're, we're moving away from that. Um, and it's really, uh, it, it's really troubling. And, you know, on the idea of, of you know, what does liberal mean anymore? <clears throat> I remember, you know, going to, uh, in school, I, I was uh, basically an English major, you know, studying the humanities. And so much of what we read was about transgressive literature, transgressive artists, people who were willing to, uh, to challenge the status quo, take on sacred cows and all that. And... We used to hold those people up on on a pedestal uh, in New York. I remember, I think it was back in the '90s under Giuliani. There was a controversy over the art piece called "Piss Christ," which was a crucifix in a jar of urine. And you know, th- there's a there's, I remember this. Yeah, yeah. You know, and there, yeah. there there's, there's definitely a libertarian argument to be made. What well, well uh, should uh, you know public funds be going to fund you know going towards the arts? Um, you know, there's obviously that argument, but then there's the argument of well, is that obscene? Is it okay that someone uh, is able to do that? And I, th- you know, obviously I can understand why that would be upsetting to, you know, devout Christians. Um, but also, you know, that type of art, uh, if you want to call it that, uh, also provides an opportunity to, to be introspective and to look at yourself and look at, you know, well, why is this, um, why is this, you know, where is the sacred and the profane and all that? I guess I'm going back into like sort of my my um, college uh, term paper writing mode in a way. You know, I could probably spin out a, a B minus paper for you uh, on it. But so, this stuff was yeah. Was there I, I, to shock I don't you. remember what year that was, but uh, you know, the whole debate about Maplethorpe and and mm-hmm. public funding of all the stuff that he was doing, um, and and I, I I was working on Capitol Hill at the time, and this is this is the 1994, 1905 Republican Revolution. There was a time when Republicans actually wanted to eliminate funding for entire departments of government. It seems it seems like a unicorn mm-hmm. fantasy now because because now all they do is fight over expanding this program, that program. Um, and and back in my boss's district, the arts community was all up in arms because we wanted to defund 
the NEA and the um, right. what is it NEH Humanities I forget the alphabets and I'm like and and my argument was do you, do you really want Jesse Helms who was then chairman of the appropriate committee to decide what art is do you want politics to decide what art <laughs> is and I could plug and play that argument with almost anything in civil life I don't want politicians deciding what comedy is I don't want them deciding what art is I'd love for consumers decide to decide whether or not um, you want to spend your dollars to go see Maplethorpe mm -hmm. and if you do go for it but but don't make don't make me do it and that's sort of that that cosmopolitan libertarian perspective you know we could all do the things that we want to do as long as we don't force anybody else to do it yeah and, and actually a, a couple of years ago when I was in LA my, my wife and I we went went to see a, a Maplethorpe exhibit and it was the first time I'd ever you know uh, confronted a Maplethorpe, if you will, because it's sort of, you know, confronting. And it's like looking at these at these photos, number one, I never felt like, you know, less of an artist and also I've never felt like less of a man. I'm like, oh my God, these figures are just uh, incredible uh, and all that coming together. I hate dudes that work out. <laughs> I, hate dudes that work I really out. hate those guys. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, take a site like The Onion. The Onion had a brilliant piece called uh it was op the opening day of the robert maplethorpe children's museum <laughs> so you have like you have these photoshop images of kids climbing gigantic dildos and stuff <laughs> and it was so perfect it was it was it was so amazing um and uh now, now you've triggered the audience yeah we're yeah. gonna have to put a trigger warning over this section right right <laughs> can we can we do that in post just yes. put a, a dildo warning yeah yeah we're, we're fine we're fine. yeah we'll work through it <laughs> But it's like, uh, you know, with comedy, like, I think there's a higher purpose to it. So a lot of it is is just, can we just laugh a little bit? Can we have some fun? Does it always have to be angry politics? Is it always like tribal warfare where you have to destroy the other side? But I also think the best comedians take on um, stereotypes and, and they push us out of our pre-existing expectations about who other people are and, and what they do. And, you know, if, if there isn't that first person that's willing to say something that the rest of us thinks a little bit crazy, I don't know how it is that we get through the process of, of, of accepting neighbors who are different from us. You know, maybe they go to a different church. Maybe, maybe they have different sexual orientation, whatever it is. You know, if their parents are for some, for somewhere else, um, there, there is that inherent tribalism in, in human beings like, mm -hmm. you know, where I grew up was, was my definition of normal when I was a kid, by definition. Um, so I feel like this, this, particularly when it comes to comedy, but obviously the, the broader question of what you can't say in civil society is super dangerous because it pushes us all back into our tribal corners where we're just going to, we're going to hate those other guys because we don't understand them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and also that wasn't even a question. No, 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 I, I, I totally agree. And, you know, when you're coming from, I mean, just in everyday life, don't, I mean, don't you love it when you meet somebody and they, and they tell you something and it's a completely new perspective and you're like, wow, you know, I never thought about that before. That's so interesting. And I, and I feel like that's, that's what you got to do if you're, you know, if you're doing comedy to, to give that, that, um, that other perspective. Because one of the things that I, that I found is when, when we're making, uh, when we're making videos, uh, we're nonpartisan. We, we call ourselves equal opportunity offenders. And uh, a few of the, um, we've kind of had a streak of videos that have come out where we've been, you know, kind of going after the left, in particular, um, the idea of like identity politics and, and that sort of thing. And one of the commenters pointed out, he's like, hey, you know, it's been a while since you've, uh, you know, made fun of, uh, you know, made fun of the right. And, and, you know, I really, you know, I took that and I started thinking, you know, thinking about it. And, and I realized, well, well, I'm in a position where when I put something out, two things have to be there. One, it has to be funny because I'm a self-identified comedian. And, and two, it has to be original. And, you know, we're living in a great time for comedy, I think, where anybody who wants to take part can do it. Anybody can start their own show. Anybody can turn on uh, their phone, you know, record something and, and put it out there. If all you can handle is like a, a 60 second video, Instagram's there for you. You know, if you want to go longer, YouTube's there. Um, so there's all this competition and all these people sort of chomping at the bit of 
chomping at the bit and creating bits on the same same material. And some of them are pro comics, others are amateurs, just funny friends who like to post stuff on on Twitter and all that. You know, so there are some topics where it's like, yeah, man, I got nothing. I there's nothing I can say that's original about this thing. But if I can, you know, make something original, like uh, you know, if I can attack, you know, Trump in a new way that's that's original, yeah, I'm gonna do it. Yeah, you yeah. Know? But it and but I, I thought you were gonna say that there's there's such an imbalance now, and because there's plenty, there's plenty of. Of very good comedians and some crappy comedians that that just love making fun of Republicans and conservatives and mm. and Trump. Like I don't I don't think you can watch Stephen Colbert for ten minutes before he mentions and makes fun of of Donald Trump. Yeah, it's sort of his what, his bread and butter. Yeah, I think. yeah. But but not just him. Like you know, mm-hmm. The Daily Show and and Bill Maher may do it once in a while where he he picks on President Trump, and and I think all that's fine. I I think it's great, um, particularly comedians making fun of politicians mm-hmm. even your guy right is great because we we shouldn't trust politicians and and comedy is that great space where you can sort of you know uh peel the bark off of these guys and and expose them as hypocrites when they're being hypocritical but it's it's pretty one-sided like i don't i don't see bill maher uh making fun of democrats that often he does it once in a while he's mm-hmm. he's got some problems have with you been on the politi- show okay. yeah yeah oh. a couple times okay. and um, never has there been a more hostile audience oh, really? for me. Like, um, uh, Bill, the, the panel's okay. Like you, you actually get to speak and, and he lets everybody, uh, give, make sure everybody has a little bit of time. But, uh, my wife was sitting in the audience and, <laughs> and she's surrounded by people who are calling her husband an asshole wow. again and again and again. And she she wanted to turn she didn't because she was afraid for her life but she wanted to turn and said yeah he's an asshole but he's my asshole <laughs> so I get to call him that right. you don't but but you know I, I think you know conservatives get really upset about Bill Maher and they get really upset about all these comedians that are constantly picking on them but I say go for it um, as long as we're allowed to pick on them mm-hmm. as long as and you know we're we're libertarians so we're almost Switzerland I like. You said equal opportunity offender. Yeah, we want to make fun of everybody, particularly if they're po- politicians. Yeah, um, and and I think you know, my, and I get that uh, question quite often, where people ask, "Well, you know, why aren't there more you know comedians on the right and and, and all that?" And I'm like, I'm like, well, there's no reason why there shouldn't be. You know, that you have all these opportunities to make fun, you know, to make fun of stuff and to show your perspective because you know you could list all the shows, Samantha B and The Daily Show, John, you know, John Oliver. Um, you know, the re- recently canceled shows on Netflix and all that. It's like they're coming from the same point of view and they're, you know, catering to their audiences, ho- however big they are. Uh, and that leaves you an opportunity there to have a niche that, and, and what better way to have a niche than, than one that's your own, you know? Um, it, it's a funny thing where I, uh, I'll put stuff out and I'll have other comedians say, oh, you're just, you're just trying to be edgy. Or, uh, yeah, you're just trying to be, like, politically incorrect or offensive and all that. And it's like, I've been doing comedy for 17 years trying to develop this voice, yeah. you know? And I'm putting this out there because I believe in it. Now, now I believe in it, you know, some of this stuff I believe in because they're, you know, uh, principles that I hold. But for the most part, when I'm putting a joke out there, I'm putting it out there because I believe in the joke. And, and... It, to turn it around, I mean, it would like it would be like me telling another comedian, like, "Oh, well, you actually don't believe the stuff that you believe. You just you just know that staying middle of the road and taking on the right targets that's the way you're going to get ahead." You know, to be cynical like that, yeah, I think would be. A, what a I'm, what I'm, one of my favorite bits that you did was uh, "Stop making me defend Trump." Uh, best video ever, and Thanks, and I, I feel like that way every day. Like, um, you know. As as many of and this is a, this is a week where Trump did something that I thought was probably the most egregious thing he's done as president with declaring a national emergency. They're debating mm-hmm. it on Capitol Hill, um, and and I, I think that's that's way over the line of anything that would be acceptable for a, a conservative to buy into. Um, but but where did where did that video come from? Um, it, the the idea for it came from uh, an actor that that I work with in a, in a lot of our videos. Uh, his name is Gary Mahmoud. And uh, he came came up with the idea. He's like, yeah, man. He's like, I was. Um, I think it might have come from a, from a real experience of him kind of being on set, 
and somebody bringing up a topic and it's uh, about Trump and him being like, yeah, you know, I don't like the guy, but he didn't actually say that. And then, you know, having that being turned around on him and like, oh, you must you must support him. Yeah. And um, uh, unfortunately, Gary was unable to uh, to play the role. So I played Gary, you know, what I think is good for me, you know, because I, I get to put my my mug out there. Um, but what, what I what I really liked about that video was the responses that we had afterward where there were so many people where, you know, almost to a T, it was, I can't stand the guy, but I'm so tired of people of people coming up with stuff that just isn't true about him or me having to correct them. And, you know, it's awesome when we're able to really just connect with people on that, you know, on that level. I feel like it's, it's probably an Achilles heel to um, people that, that are sort of the loyal opposition to people that want to stop Trump. Um, I think I think Trump derangement syndrome is a real thing, and mm-hmm. you, you freak out about every tweet and every single thing that he does to the point where, um, uh, you know, I watched uh, Van Jones, super progressive CNN guy, former Obama uh, green energy czar. Um, he was working with Trump on criminal justice reform, and and the left was shredding him. And he was saying he was trying, sounding quite reasonable, saying, "Shouldn't, shouldn't, if we can get prison reform, if we can do something, just steps right. about mass incarceration, shouldn't we do that?" <laughs> and I, and I sort of, I sort of felt his pain because because I took a lot of flack uh, in, during the Obama administration when I, when I would meet with Obama's attorney general to talk about criminal justice reform, and and all sorts of conservatives were freaking out. How dare you talk to those guys? I'm like, dude, I'm going to talk to anybody on an issue where we agree on something, but, but they, they get blinded by the fact that it's this guy that, you know, Donald Trump is the first guy um, to unwind some of Bill Clinton's uh, uh, horrible mandatory minimums, federalization of crime, all that, all that stuff that has packed our prisons with, with mostly kids of color mm-hmm. who committed nonviolent crimes. And, and that makes their head explode. It was Donald Trump that did that. Get over it. Like, go for it. Celebrate it. Yeah. Yeah, and look for those. And that's the thing. Like, you can't, you know, for, for my brothers and sisters out there of the resistance, like, you can't let him rule your life. And I remember shortly after after he won, I, I did a, an interview. I think, I think it was with Amanda Marcotte um, for, um, I think it was like Salon or something like that. And, uh, and she was like, well, you know, what are you doing? And I'm like, well, you know, I... I have people I love and, and I have a life and I'm going to, I'm going to focus on that. (laughs) And, you know, I, 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 I think that there, there's something, maybe there's something lacking where, uh, people are so uh, feel better about kind of glomming onto this collective angst and, and, and animosity, you know, towards, towards the guy. Um, but I think it's really just, it's, it's ruining relationships and I think it's ruining, it's ruining people. And, uh, and it's unfortunate because you hear, you hear stories about people who like, yeah, I no longer talk to my parents or, you know, I no longer talk to friends from high school because, you know, we, we can't seem to agree, um, on, on this guy. And it's like, well, we'll find the stuff that you do agree on and, and work towards that. Um, I feel like you're omitting a key data point here oh. because, According to the things I've seen on the internet, we're all going to be dead in 12 years because of catastrophic global warming. Right. So <clears throat> why not go to war with your neighbor? Because because it's their fault. Yeah. Well, actually, I did a, a, a released a, a recent video uh, where I say that uh, I am not scared of climate change, and it's like I believe in it, but I'm not scared. And and part of the reason why I'm not scared about it is because all the people telling me to be scared are not acting scared enough, you know? Um, so I, I feel like, I feel like, you know, if the world really was going to end in 12 years, people would be, it'd be the walking dead. Right? Oh yeah. Pe- yeah, exactly. Well, well, that's the thing. It's like, there, I mean, can you point out a liberal doomsday prepper? All the doomsday preppers I know are conservatives. I mean, you know, right. it's sort of like, you know, maybe if, if they were stockpiling kombucha or something like that, I'd, I'd be more inclined to believe them. But, um, but yeah, that, that's the thing too, you know, sort of, you know, these doomsday or these doomsday or doomsdayers. I don't know. We can c- cut that out. He's, yeah. he's cracking up. He's, he's, <laughs> he's going to be, uh, 
Um, I think he's having a fit of some sort, the man behind the camera. Um, so the, these, you know, kind of like doomsday people. Uh, and it's like, you know, when people are scared, they don't make good decisions. When people uh, are surrounded by, you know, people that they perceive as their enemy, they don't make good decisions. Uh, and I wish people would, you know, sort of take a breath, you know, step back and and see like, okay, well, what, what do I really have to worry about? And what can I really change? And what can I really fix? And sort of focus on that. So if I was Rick and Michonne, and oh, I no. knew ahead of time that the zombie apocalypse was coming, I, I feel like uh, the first thing I would do is, is buy more guns. Certainly. Um, so if the world is ending in 12 years, I feel like you should not only be against gun control, but maybe you should, should mandate that everyone sort of stock up. Yeah. Well, a few years ago during uh, Hurricane Irma, um, the police had to tell people not to shoot their guns at the hurricane. Um, and I'll tell you what, man, that, that actually got me like more interested in climate change. I'm like, whoa, we could kill this thing? That would be amazing. <laughs> well, these were Floridians. <laughs> yeah, so. they're, they're, yeah. So. they're operating on a, different, uh, on a different plane, astral plane. Yeah, the, the Florida man. Yeah, I saw that. And you had, I, w- I was totally triggered because you had like a, a muscle tee on that said, screw the polar bears or something. Oh, yeah. Uh, fu- uh, <laughs> the polar bears. Yeah. 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 This is a family show. We're going to oh, bleep, I'm, I'm sorry, bleep that I'm out. sorry about that. But they, you, they yelled at me. I, I, I dropped the F bomb once and we're like, oh, wow. We now have to bleep that out. <laughs> you, uh, you can bleep it out, but, but seriously, <laughs> the polar bears. Yeah. They're, they're big, they're white, they're menacing. You know, they, those they, guys. they eat people. Yeah. Yeah. They're not, they're not nice. Not nice at all. Um, but that, you know, that, that shirt was triggering to me because <laughs> I, I believed that, that all the animals loved each other and, and would love us. But right. not yeah. anymore. Not anymore. So let's, um, uh, and we could get back to making fun of, of progressives and conservatives, but uh, equal opportunity offenders. Let, let's make fun of libertarians. This show, I use the L word and, and I, I self-identify so that people know where I'm coming from. Um, but, but our first guest was Glenn Beck and we spent a little bit of time and, and Glenn is sort of liberty curious. Like he's goatee Glenn Beck. Did he have the goatee? Yeah. yeah he had oh, the goatee. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Um, but, but libertarians can be a little ridiculous sometimes. Oh yeah. Yeah. I actually, I have a, uh, uh, anytime I go to a, to an event with libertarians, I have a, a little sign that I do with my friends to let them know, you know, to come save me from a conversation. Uh, basically, I, I pull on my ear and then I just yell, kill me. And then they come <laughs> over. And I, because it, it's, it's ironic because if you've ever been in a conversation with a libertarian, it doesn't feel voluntary yeah. at all. You know, it's sort of like, oh, I got to get out of here. <laughs> you know. and, and you're cornered and... Uh... Um, but they're they're not even talking about the non-aggression principle. They're they're saying the nap, the nap. That's right. And they and they cross themselves when they do it because it, it is a sacred thing. Yeah, and you never know what they're like. Is the nap up here? Because they're never making eye contact. It's just kind of, you know. <laughs> but but we do have. I mean, we have this this disease. I mean, I I'm so old that when I was when I was a libertarian, there was only a dozen of us in the United States. <laughs> And um, we didn't really know each other because we spent all of our time chasing the other 11 people out of the room because Mm -hmm. they were only 99.9%. A few of them, shockingly, thought that it wasn't immoral to walk on a government-paved sidewalk. And that's unacceptable. You can't can't have Galt's Gulch if you're walking on government sidewalks. Yeah, you got to eat. That's why the hoverboard needs to be invented. I don't know if Elon Musk is on that, but but just to to allow libertarians to just sort of literally float above the fray. Well, there's I mean there's a whole there's a whole movement called seasteading, and, right? And Logan Logan is an affectionado of this, and and we're actually going to get the seasteading guy on. He's a good guy, um, but I but I worry that in order to seastead, you're probably going to need to build a community. Mm. And, you know, in order to have a community, you're going to have to cooperate and you're going to have to agree to disagree on certain things um, because it seems expensive for every single person to build their own floating nation. Their own buoy. Yeah. yeah. It, it just, I don't think it would work as well. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is a, you know, it, it sort of makes sense why there are so, you know, few, you know, libertarians and why we're unable to 
really get things done. It's like, because, well, yeah, we're individuals and, and, you know, individuals don't want to, yeah, <laughs> you know, often not cats. Yeah. I, I, I worry, you know, sometimes when, when I describe myself as a libertarian, because I know I'm, I'm never going to measure up to, you know, whatever that ideal is of libertarian, you know, that's like, yeah, I'm a libertarian. And then I meet, uh, you know, an anarcho capitalist and I'm like, Oh man, I, I'm, I, am I doing enough? Am I, am I enough for me? Am yeah. I enough? Cause I'm not enough for you guys. <laughs> um, but it, 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 you know, the, the mission of all this stuff and these conversations, I'm, I love picking on libertarians because I'm one of them. So I feel like, yeah, I feel like I have, even on a college campus, I could make jokes about libertarians because I'm one and I'll be triggered before anybody else is. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the standard. I don't, I don't quite understand. <laughs> it, it might, it might be. Yeah. Uh, I, I oftentimes when I make a, if I make a joke that touches on like on race, um, I say, I can say it because I'm Latino. You can say it cause it's true. So if we, <laughs> if we keep it up. Um, but the, you know, that the high minded purpose of, of, of having these conversations is I, I think most young people have been, you know, they, they've grown up in this radically democratized world because of the internet. They get, they, they curate everything. I, I call it the a la carte generation mm -hmm. um, because they're used to deciding for themselves about everything. It, it, it's not just music, but it's friends and it's communities and it's information and it's knowledge. And, and, and they have this, this, beautiful open source way of, of figuring out stuff for themselves if they want to, um, except when it comes to politics. You know, when it comes to politics, some guy in a smoke-filled room decided, and maybe there's two guys, we don't know, because it was secret, somebody decided that they got to choose between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. And young people are like, really? Only two choices? I don't even, I don't even understand what that means. Mm. So there's, there's got to be this, this uh, uh, I hate to use the word center because I, I, think, I think a better description is, is there's, an, there's an alienated majority outside of this political bubble that are looking for the alternative. Um, and they're saying, can't we all get along? Can't, can't we just figure out how to cooperate and tolerate? And, and I'm thinking to myself, that's us. That, mm. That's libertarians. If, if we can get out of our own little tribe, and start talking to people um, on the left, on the right, independents, whoever they are. Um, that's that's why having reasonable conversations, I think, is sort of the counter counter revolution because people are tired of the clickbait. Clickbait is driven by the tribal warfare between the far right and the far left. Um, there's got to be something better. Yeah, and I, th I think a big part of it too is, and I'm, I'm sure you've had this experience where. Um, if you're, you know, watching like a group of libertarians talk about something, it, it could often devolve into, you know, sort of, well, you're wrong because of this, this, and this reason, you know? Um, and I, and I think most people don't like to be told that they're wrong. I think most people don't like to be uh, told that they're stupid <laughs> or anything like that. Um, whereas I, I think it's a reasonable assumption. It's a reasonable yeah. assumption. I, I know I hate it. Um, Whereas, you know, I'm sort of, I'm in a position where the stuff that I produce, it's about trying to persuade people to subscribe and to watch more of my stuff and to share it. Um, so I want to make sure that what I'm putting out there is something that someone sees value in. And I think if, if we started to look at, um, you know, issues, and it's not just for libertarians, I think for people, people in general, where it's like, hey, this is something I really care about. This is why I think you should care about it, too. And hey, this is a way that we, you know, can work together to make this happen. And I'm going to, and instead of looking at this as I'm going to debate you or destroy you online, um, this is the way that I see the world. And, and hey, you know what, if my argument isn't strong enough, uh, I'll go back and try to get stronger arguments. I think trying to have more, uh, you know, just more, you know, communication, you know, with that, with that end goal, I think would be a lot more helpful. Um, and I, I know that I'm, I'm lucky to have a group of people, um, in in new york who come from you know all different side you know all different uh ends of the spectrum when it comes to politics people are are liberals a lot of democrats and all that and the one thing that unites us is we're all pro free speech and we're all really you know um, disgusted by people being being shut down or people you know sort of uh being called uh you know 
fascist or racist right out of the gate because uh, because it's an easy way to uh, get it's kind, re- it's to kind s- of a conversation, conversation stopper. Like oh, totally. I mean, how someone how, calls you a Nazi and you're like, uh, I guess I don't want to talk to you. Yeah, it's like, do I have to spend the next you know how, however long you know uh, you know telling you that you know that this uh, swastika tattoo washes off? You know. Um, <laughs> Uh, but but you know being united you know with the idea of hey we don't know everything and there are people out there who we could learn from uh, and they might be different uh, than us um, I think that that's something that that I'm fortunate that I've had you know in my in my life why do you, I mean I have, I don't have a good answer for this so I ask everyone else and um, maybe you have an answer but you know there was a time not that long ago when uh, you see Berkeley would invite the enemy, um, you know, William F. Buckley or, you know, someone that was considered absolutely far right back in the day to come speak and, and students who were decidedly left would show up and, and listen respectfully and, and argue and debate and all that stuff. And that was, that was sort of the, you know, the shining star of, of the left. Free speech was the thing, the ACLU uh, famously would defend, um, you know, even neo-Nazis' right, right to say stupid stuff, right? And that's that's gone. It's 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 definitely gone on campus. But you even see, um, you know, the L- ACLU is sliding back and 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 hemming and hawing and and qualifying their support for free speech. What what's what's happening? Why is that happening? Why is that happening? Whew. Um I think well, I think like uh, I think uh, Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff are um, discuss that in their in their book, uh, the coddling of the American mind, uh, where the idea of you know uh, trying to protect kids and make them you know rather than treat them as I forget, is it anti fragile, I forget I forget their the the wording that that they use, but uh, basically treating kids like they're these fragile things that are going to break um, and that they need to be kept away from any kind of, uh, you know, negative stimulus uh, is, you know, sort of slowly but surely, you know, creating kids who, you know, view uh, disagreement as personal attack or, you know, are uh, incapable of handling, you know, things that people were, you know, were handling for, you know, for uh, millennia. Is that how long it would be? I don't know. Um I mean, there might be something, you know, something to that. You know, it is trouble. It, it's troubling when you look at the, you know, who are the, you know, staunch defenders of, of free speech rights, and you look at someone like Nadine Strassen, who former president of the ACLU. Um, you know, she's an she's an older person now. She's an, an older woman. Nat Hentoff just passed away uh, a few years ago, and it's like, where are are the young um, vocal? Uh, proponents of, of, you know, robust uh, inquiry and free speech. Um, there are some uh, young people out there like uh, there's this uh, kid named Zach Wood who has a, a, a new book uh, coming out about um, uh, what he describes as um, um, sort of uncomfortable learning and being willing to confront things that uh, ideas that you're uncomfortable with. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know if that answers it. No, I, I, I think that's right, and uh, I'm going to butcher her name, but I think her name's Lenora Skenazi. Yeah, Lenora Skenazi, yeah. Skenazi, yeah. 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 Uh, she writes about helicopter moms, and she's sort of the the um, radical mom that let her kids grow up mm-hmm. and make mistakes, and, and, and they were just fine. Like I'm, I'm old enough that I was actually allowed to play in the dirt when I was oh, a yeah. kid, which, yeah. which isn't a thing anymore in it. Right. There's but, no more dirt. Yeah, but but you know that unfortunately, I think I think a lot of conservatives have have sort of embraced that that sort of censorious style of argument, and and you know every time Bill Maher says something stupid, there's this effort to get him deplatformed. The same way that the the left would do, uh, you know, someone like Stephen Crowder is is having a bunch of trouble, and he's he's a he's a contributor also. Um, on Blaze TV, which is which is who publishes this, um, but I'm like I'm like the guy that I don't want to deplatform anybody. Mm-hmm. I even think Alex Jones. I, I think he's a performance artist. I don't 
like if you take him seriously, um, you're, you're not getting the joke. I think he may actually get his own joke. I'm not sure. Although I haven't tried his supplements. Um, <laughs> they might be amazing. Who knows? Well, he looks fantastic. Yeah, so, I mean, he looks great. Yeah. So you you got to... You got to want to look like that with your shirt off. I think he's only like 25 years old. I think <laughs> he just, I don't know what he's been putting into his veins, but. The best thing on the internet, um, it, besides your videos, oh, of course, <laughs> is uh, someone took uh, the most offensive things that Alex Jones ever said and, and strung them together and put them to a uh, Bon Iver song. Have, yeah. have you seen this? It's it's brilliant. I, I have I actually watched it once for 24 hours straight because it was so fantastic. It, it's it's amazing, yeah. yeah. Everybody, your homework assignment is go find that video on YouTube. Yeah, uh, well, I, I think there's something about the culture now where um, it's, it's not just, I disagree with the speaker, it's this speaker needs to be eliminated. They yeah. should not have a, have a platform. It's it's not the screw that guy. I'm going to go on with my own life. It's no, you are wrong, and therefore I'm going to effectively try to destroy you. And you know you see you see that happening now. Where like you said, you'll you'll have you know conservatives calling for Bill Maher's you know t to be fired, or, or you know there, there was that dust up when he used the N word uh, on it, and I think people on the left were calling him for him to lose a job. And then you had people on the right saying, Hey, you know what? He should, because, uh, you know, uh, you reap what you sow. Um, and that's a really, it, it's a really troubling thing because obviously it's going to be used against you at, uh, at some point. And you, you, I, I've seen like a few instances, uh, uh, recently of, you know, people who are working in stores who, uh, are you know big time jerks to someone who comes in wearing a MAGA hat, and either they curse at them, they say the wrong thing, and when those people get fired, everyone applauds, and you know I could I can understand why you know you'd want to see someone like that get fired, but there's got to be some room for people to make mistakes and to pay for their mistakes and go on and live live their life, and it's sort of, it, I I just feel like there's absolutely no forgiveness now. And and maybe this is just my way of saying, like, please forgive me for everything that I've ever done. Yeah, I really, yeah. Just start with me. Um, well, it's a politici politicization of everything. Yeah. And I, I feel like, you know, we have this this sort of naive view of de democracy and government. And it, it feels like everything is about who's the president. Like mm -hmm. we have to have the presidency so that we can force 49 percent of the public to conform to our values, to our speech code to to our lifestyles and and I feel like uh, lots of conservatives do this now um, the, the, the left maybe started the fight I feel that way but who knows but it, it doesn't matter and I, I think the the, the window for um, the rest of us is um, I want to live in an America where we could actually learn to get along with each other and 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 part of that would be like teaching jerks that that attack kids with mega hats to just back off right mm -hmm. um that the hat's fine you'll be fine um, right and you're you're probably wearing a t-shirt that offends that kid too um that's maybe, maybe we have to set that standard because i feel like this is all otherwise a spiral a spiraling war that that gets out of hand mm -hmm. no, no totally um and you got to make it funny right you, the the, yeah. ans the answer is to make the beautiful part of making fun of somebody else. Yeah, like I thought just a little bit of fun. Yeah, like I thought the like for me the most egregious part of the whole Nathan Phillips Co high school, you know, the Covington High School boys was his drumming was terrible. Yeah, I mean, you know, he, he is not a John Bonham. You yeah, know? for me that was the most <laughs> that was so reckless. How do you go? How do you? Um, that that I I feel like you just ended the conversation perfectly right there. Give us a shameless plug for We the Internet. Uh, guys, thank you so much for the time. I'm Lou Perez with We The Internet TV. Please subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook. Check us out on Instagram and Twitter. And uh, thank you so much for the time. Appreciate it. After you subscribe. And After. Click, click the bell for Kibbe on Liberty. That's right. Thank you so much. Thanks, man. Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. By now, you know this is the most important event of your week. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube, 
Click the little bell so you get notifications. Kibbe on Liberty, mostly honest conversations with mostly interesting people.